Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I don't have a list of who's uh, online, but I hope uh, we have a good audience tuned in. Um, I'd like to wish everybody a very warm welcome to the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society annual meeting. Um, we're doing a little differently this year. Ask for your patience. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to encourage everybody to make an effort to reach out to one another. We don't get in this format of meeting the same kind of interactivity that we're used to having at our meeting, the same level of interpersonal connection that we get. So we'll have to try to make those connections in other ways and at other times. Uh, in the meantime, let me introduce our esteemed chair for the meeting. Garish Nair has put an enormous amount of work into this meeting. Um, Garish, take it away. Your mic. Uh, Uh, good evening, uh, John, and uh, good evening to everybody. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to the eighth annual meeting of Canadian Heart Rhythm Pro Professionals. The CHRS annual meeting has uh, always strived to showcase young Canadian clinicians and investigators while utilizing the expertise of established leaders in the field. We've been fortunate that international experts in the field of cardiac arrhythmias, including physicians, allied health professionals and a diverse group of speakers have agreed to present their research and unique perspectives of the meeting. I would like, I would like to extend a special welcome to Drs. John Manrola, Pugarendi Vijayaraman, and Roderick Tung, our international speakers who are leaders in the field of cardiac arrhythmias. This year, we are introducing an interactive Jeopardy session as an educational event for fellows in training, and I hope that this session will be enjoyed by all. I would like to offer special thanks to Drs. Martin Green, Matthew Bennett, Mohamed Sadek, and Douglas Van for adding this element of fun through learning to the program. I would also like to thank the entire faculty for sharing their incredible expertise and knowledge with us. The scientific program had to be abbreviated due to the virtual meeting format, and we were unable to include as many speakers and sessions as we had originally intended to. The scientific committee will strive to include many more speakers and sessions during the following years. First, I would like to thank all our sponsors, in particular, Bison's Webster, Medtronic, Abbott, Pfizer, BMS, Serbia, and Boston Scientific for their generous support and commitment to education, research, and professional development. I would like to thank my fellow planning committee members, John, David, and all others and the CHRS Board of Directors for the opportunity to chair this meeting. This meeting would not have been possible, but for the organizational support and countless hours of work put in by the Canadian, Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society team of Sarah Faubert, Milan Jacques, Jody McGomb, and Linda Palmer. Lastly, I would like to thank Shubhayan Sanathani and Benedict Lauer, our previous meeting chairs for sharing their insights with us. This edition of the meeting was to be hosted in Winnipeg and the entire CHRS community was looking forward to meeting each other in an entirely new venue. I sincerely hope that at some point in the future, we'll be able to congregate in the beautiful city of Winnipeg. This is also the first instance that CHRS is hosting this meeting on a virtual platform because of the global pandemic. We request your patience and understanding during the virtual meeting as we have yet to perfect this format. I would urge all of you to actively participate in the scientific sessions and provide us valuable feedback to help us improve future meetings. Please take this opportunity to network with your friends and get in touch with people you see once a year, mostly at this meeting. Uh, finally, I would like to go over a few logistical items before I hand you over to the chairs for our inaugural session. Number one, I would urge all of you to register for the Jeopardy session using the link in your chat box and to visit the virtual exhibit hall showcasing some of the latest advances in the field of arrhythmias from our sponsors. I would like to remind you that this event is an accredited group learning activity uh, within section one as defined by the maintenance of certification program of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and approved by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society you may claim a maximum of six hours of MOCOM credits. Immediately following this presentation, we will have Q&A sessions. 
The Q&A period will be an opportunity for audience members to ask our panelists pressing questions and encourage constructive discussion among the faculty. Due to the limited time and scope of the content, we will not be accepting or addressing any questions before the Q&A period begins. You can use the question panel on your webinar dashboard throughout the presentation to put your questions in the queue for the Q&A session and the uh, chairs will uh, address them to the uh, speakers. Now I leave you to enjoy the rest of the evening and have a great meeting. Thanks, Karish. Um, I have uh, one other uh, very uh, pleasant duty to discharge before we begin the scientific portion. Uh, this year, we have moved our annual award presentations to this meeting rather than holding them at uh, the CCS meeting uh, since they are going virtual as well. And uh, tonight, um, with thanks to the chair of the awards committee, Francois Philippon, um, I will uh, present two awards. First, the Annual Achievement Award and the Magdi Basta Award. The uh, Canadian Heart Rhythm Society Annual Achievement Award goes to a CHRS member who's made an outstanding contribution during their career in the field of cardiovascular heart rhythm. And this year's awardee is Dr. Bob Sheldon. Um, Bob joins luminaries like Dr. Dorian, Natal, Tang, Mitchell, Kerr, Wise, Klein, and Hua um, over the, the, the prior awardees. Bob, Bob is very well known to you. Bob, you can turn your, your camera on any moment so that you can blush while I talk about how amazing you are. Uh, Bob received his PhD in molecular biology uh, from Colorado, his MD from Toronto. Don't hold it against him. And he's on faculty at the University of Calgary, uh, where he's had a very illustrious career, uh, both clinical and research. He served as their senior VP for Alberta Health Services. He's been the associate dean for clinical research at the University of Calgary, served on governing council for CIHR, and uh, is extremely well known for his work in autonomic physiology. He has uh, been absolutely dogged in in sussing out every part of, of syncope and just defining the field for the rest of us. So a thank you to him and a recognition from all of us. As well, he is he's perhaps best known for how humble he is, uh, a, a humble mentor who gives generously of his time and talent to teach and inspire other words. Bob, congratulations on uh, this, this recognition. Um, for the annual achievement award from the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society. And uh, everybody is uh, applauding at home, I'm sure. Thank you, John. Uh, I just before I begin 20 seconds of comments, I went to Toronto. I had to go to Toronto because McMaster wouldn't take me and Calgary wouldn't take me. <laughs> and so I went where I was. And I hope nobody here is from Toronto. Usually there isn't. Um, <laughs> And I left there as fast as I could. So, you know, I uh, I am touched. I am humbled by this. You know, if you look at the names, I'm humbled, I'm grateful, overwhelmed. But I want to point out something. So fish, fish have got to swim in a sea. And they have to swim with other fish, unless they're sharks. Uh, and and the sea for Canada Arrhythmia investigators is is the best in the world. It's just an astonishing place to be, and it makes all of us better for it. It's been going on for over 100 years. So the first really uh, international effort was the demonstration of uh, reentry by George Mines and the, uh, the first demonstration of uh, the initiation of BF in humans by critically timed extra stimulus uh, by George Mines as well, who was also the patient. And since then, it's just been one thing after another world's first transcutaneous pacemaker, that's 70 years ago now, from Toronto. Um, the uh, use of cl clinical tilt tests realized they're not really mainstream, but that was three Canadians. That was Manash Waxman from Toronto, uh, David Bendit, and uh, Roseanne Kenny from Saskatchewan. Um, were the ILR developed in Western Ontario, George Klein, Andrew Cron. Um, Cryocath, right? The idea came from Boston, but actually it was Montreal Heart Institute that brought it into life with the leadership of Steve Arles, who's an entrepreneur, one of the best in the world. 
um, the CAF study, the CARAF study, affirm the far too numerous uh, McMaster randomized clinical trials. Um, the the uh, um, uh, little brain of the heart with the two armors. Everybody who ablates atrial fib now and vasovagal syncope may be to come. That's Drew Armour, they got that going. Um, and as well as that, I mean, we've had really superb mentoring. You mentioned part of it, but you know, people like Tony Tang, Martin Green, Brent Mitchell, George Wise, wonderful, wonderful mentors. Um, devices, randomized clinical, so big organizations, C-SPIN, Canet, these are unparalleled elsewhere in the world. And we're still living with their legacy. Uh, we have been invested. Stan Natel, I think, has done the best work in the world. And he's also the best cardiovascular editor in the world, I think, having been rejected many times by him. But I think he's the best in the world, frankly. Um, finally, I, re I really like to thank all the post collaborators who've uh, been really hard at it, randomizing patients and following them. They're very difficult to randomize. So thanks very much, everyone. I really like to thank us on behalf of all of ourselves, really, because none of us exist alone. This is really an, an incredible place we're living in. Gen two is now shuffling off this mortal coil. Gen three, well, you know, the sap is rising to the top. Uh, and uh, so watch out, here come the kids. So thank you very much, everyone, for everyone. Thank you, Bob, for that. Um, and uh, all, all teasing about Toronto aside, I uh, also am a graduate of Toronto, so I, I say that with a smile. Um, I uh, have another favorite award to, uh, to distribute today. Um, and uh, this award is uh, named in memory of a former friend and colleague of mine, Magdi Basta. Many of you may not have known Magdi because he too was a humble, humble person, um, but uh, we lost him in 2014 at a young age. And one of his defining characteristics was his generosity, his generosity of spirit and uh, humility. He was very academically minded and made a uh, important contribution to many research studies, never seeking any kind of recognition or, um, or uh, um, reward for himself personally. And that is the spirit in which this award was uh, created. The Magdi Basta Award is recognized as a CHRS member who has made great efforts to support research, regardless of their own um, uh, leadership role or not. And uh, this year it goes to a very, very deserving recipient, Dr. Adrian Baranchak, uh, born in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, he did much of his training in Argentina, um, a uh, EP there, and then a research fellowship in Spain, and then a clinical EP fellowship in McMaster. And he's now a professor of medicine at Queen's University, where he's well known as a gifted teacher, a much sought after uh, uh, speaker, and a truly prolific author with more than 500 articles published president of the International Society of Electric Cardiology, Canadian VP of the Inter-American Society of Cardiology, and of course, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Electric Cardiology, his, I think his second love, perhaps after his family. Um, Adrian, uh, congratulations on this uh, recognition. It is very well deserved. Thank you very much, John. I'm, I'm very thankful and humble to receive this recognition from the CHRS. And I want to thank you, to thank Dr. Philip Hong, Dr. Nair for organizing such a wonderful meeting that we will all enjoy together. I want also to, uh, to thank Andrew Cran for his service to CCS, um, who brought our mother society to a different level. Uh, I was uh, a little bit humbled but surprised also to be recognized with this award because as as I know you do John part of our work we do it because we have we have some passion to it and and we put everything we have in it and 
to me, the equation that it brings me way more pleasure to give than to take is something that I practice in my daily life. And um, since I embraced the, the, the Canadian standard of practicing medicine, some of the transformation at a personal level was to progressively enjoy more on the act of giving than on the act of taking. So tonight is, is my role to take this recognition and I'm very thankful for that. It comes uh, on a particularly difficult moment of my life. So this has uh, definitely put a smile and a pause on some difficult moments. Um, so I want to thank lastly my mentors and more importantly my mentees who are the people that motivate me to keep going and to keep thinking on how we can share knowledge, uh, develop new platforms to educate people that is less lucky than who we are. Uh, so my, my full recognition then to my mentees and to each one of them, some of them I'm sure they may be connected tonight. Uh, finally, I want to thank the family for giving me time <laughs> to do all the things I do and without their support, I would not be able to do it. So thank you very much, I'm very thankful. Thanks and congratulations. Garish, over to you. Right, so, um... With this, uh, with these uh, heartwarming speeches, I think we'll uh, step on to the next session, the first session of the evening. Uh, and I have the privilege of introducing the chairs. Um, these two uh, chairs are rapidly rising and stellar uh, young talent in the uh, field of arrhythmias in Canada. The first chair is Zachary Laxman, who is currently a clinical assistant professor with expertise in cardiac electrophysiology at UBC, uh, Division of Cardiology and Cardiovascular Surgery. He is a principal investigator at the Center for Heart Lung Innovation and is also director of the St. Paul's Hospital Atrial Fibrillation Clinic and director of the St. Paul's Inherited Arrhythmia Clinic. I had the pleasure once uh, listening to a talk by uh, Zachary when he came to the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and I still remember the fibrillating uh, cells from that talk. And uh, with that, I go to the next chair who's equally uh, talented and uh, was one of our colleagues at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He's uh, Jason Roberts, and he's a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist and assistant professor of medicine at Western University in London, Ontario. He's a clinician scientist and his research centers on genetics of cardiac arrhythmias, uh, especially atrial fibrillation, long QT, and other uh, arrhythmic syndromes. Uh, he is especially interested in uh, gene discovery and pharmacogenetic applications. With those uh, words, I'll hand uh, the session to both the chairs to listen to our uh, panelists uh, who are, again, uh, one, uh, an, uh, an upcoming uh, electrophysiologist and other, uh, probably the, one of the most established electrophysiologists in Canada. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nair. I'll just move right along. It's really my pleasure to introduce Andrew uh, Cron. We all know of his accomplishments, but I'll go through um, some of the things that make Andrew a really special member of our community. Um, he's the division head of cardiology and a professor of medicine at UBC. He's the vice president of the Heart Rhythm Society, president of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, over 400 peer reviewed publications including all of the top tier journals that you can imagine. Uh, current research interests include genetic causes of arrhythmias, loss of consciousness, implantable arrhythmia device monitoring, major clinical interests in the Inherited Heart Rhythm Clinic and arrhythmia device management. And Andrew received his uh, MD from the University of Manitoba. Thank you, Andrew. 
Hi everybody, it's Andrew Cron here from Vancouver. Uh, thanks for the chance to be here and give the uh, first of what I think is going to be an exciting series of uh, uh, exchanges over the whole area of EP and an uh, early focus on some of the genetic uh, syndromes. Uh, when I was asked to give this topic, I thought it was rather uh, daunting because I don't consider this right inside my comfort zone. And so uh, I had to do some reading, do some thinking, and also try to take some of my ideas that we're actually working on international network and uh, put those on, uh, into a presentation. So I'll start with my conflicts of interest. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, commercial interest in this whole uh, realm, uh, but nonetheless, I'm sure that there will be and people who are involved are probably excited with all of the startups and computational elements of things that are gonna affect our day-to-day -day lives soon enough. You know me from my involvement at CCS as well as HRS, uh, which is organizational conflicts of time really more than anything. So what I want to cover today is, uh, I think what I would consider some of the unanswered questions that we could potentially try to delve into with AI and big data, uh, understand the value of it in trying to uh, answer some of those questions, uh, become familiar with the Hearts and Rhythm organization and uh, how we're taking a data strategy to try to answer some of these questions, and then look a, a bit at how this could potentially apply to patients. So uh, I start off with a case, I've always taught to start off with a case, and that's uh, these two young men here. So these are brothers, and uh, the older brother um, is asymptomatic, and you can see his ECG in the uh, uh, limb leads, and you can see his younger brother just presented with uh, an exertion-related episode of syncope that's quite worrisome. And they give a distant family history of sudden death, uh, and so the and it turns out that, uh, as you might expect, uh, they both carry uh, a long QT mutation. And the real question is, they don't look that much different. Why are their ECGs so much different? Why are they uh, not, uh, not the same? And if you looked at the ECG on the right, I would argue that if this is a preoperative ECG and somebody who gave you a history of azovagal syncope, you would not be suspicious about long QT syndrome for the most part. But the one on the left would make it quite evident. So is there ways that we can use data systems to try to detect this and try to identify risk, and predict that risk, and then mitigate it? So I think it's fair to say that most of us did some basic, uh, you know, calculus, uh, some physics, perhaps an undergrad. It may have been a long time. Um, but when it comes to data science, computational science, and so on, this is really uh, where big data and AI is at. Not only the scope of the data, but the way in which it's uh, managed and analyzed and uh, output and so on. Uh, and I think there's no question in my mind as I think about this that uh, there is, uh, it'll appear to be magic. The computational complexity is quite dramatic. Um, but at the same time, um, there are going to be answers there that we cannot deduce on our own with a, a single brain trying to uh, arrive at these conclusions. We've addressed most of this low-hanging fruit. So let's start with what's out there. So uh, this should uh, kind of make you laugh a little bit because I started off with a PubMed search and uh, artificial intelligence and heritage arrhythmia syndromes. No results found. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, let's back up a little bit, talk a little bit about what the topic is. So to, there's some terminology just to become familiar with is AI or artificial intelligence, the development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So these are not purely automated. These are in fact computer systems that perform these tasks. And the advances in both the software and the hardware, especially deep learning algorithms and the graphics processing in our GPUs, not CPUs, GPUs that power their training have led to a recent and rapidly increasing interest. And its application to medicine is obvious, but its application in other realms has been ongoing and rather dramatic. So you know, big data started with companies like Google looking at large scale data to identify patterns and predict what it is you want to buy, the things you don't like, where you're going to travel, and so on. Uh, in clinical genomics, a specific type of AI algorithm knows that deep learning is used to process large and complex data sets. And as you can imagine, if you talk about genetic sequences and you look at the scope, look of, the the data, scope of the data, it's not something, it's not something readily you can digest, readily And you need more than the usual um, straightforward comparative strategies to try to understand and analyze and output these. So I did a Google search instead of a PubMed search on this topic of inherited arrhythmia and uh, big data and AI, and I didn't find anything specific to inherited arrhythmia. The Google search brought up other things, and I learned something, uh, but not too much going on directly in this area that's already out there that's applicable. But 
let's work around the fringes and talk about where it is and where we're going. So I'll start with something that is very recent. And many of you will know that the uh, Mayo Clinic Group has been working in this whole area of using large scale data sets, and in particular the ECG data set, to try to look at ECG markers or predictors of diagnosis or risk. So this is something that was just out, which is looking at screening of uh, 12 lead ECGs to look for evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So um, they took uh, a data set of HCM patients. This involved uh, 612 HCM patients and they compared it to uh, over 40,000 controls and identified those individuals who had uh, uh, HCM using this uh, convolutional uh, neural network or CNN. They then validated in a population of uh, just under 7,000 and then went back to the original test population and ran it again. And uh, they also included parameters that looked for LVH uh, by conventional ECG parameters. Uh, they looked at the so-called normal resting ECG. They looked at age. And what you see here is sensitivities and specificities in the 90% range. The positive predictive value is still modest. So when it all comes down to it, you know, it's 31%. Negative predictive value, though, is 99%. So imagine that the next version of your automated ECG analysis algorithm may include some of these types of diagnostic questions around uh, things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy coming from screening ECGs, coming from routine health checks by fitness assessments, by uh, perioperative medicine, and so on, to try to get to the bottom of this. It was pretty exciting stuff. So our uh, national uh, organization of cardiogenetics uh, uh, participants is called the Hearts and Rhythm Organization. So this is 24 clinics across the country, both pediatric and adult. Uh, many, though not all, uh, geographies are well represented. Uh, many places um, have uh, more than one clinic in the larger urban centers. And in general, the intention is to try to make people give, give uh, patients and families access uh, to us on a large scale. Uh, the key thing with HERO is that uh, it's uh, actually a, a compilation of both interested physicians, but also things like other providers, including nurses, technicians, genetic counselors, medical geneticists, but also uh, patients and families. So it's getting beyond the research questions to the care process, to the, all the constituents involved in both being involved and also being aware. So we started this with Casper. Most of you are familiar with Casper, uh, which is the unexplained cardiac arrest population and their families. And that started uh, a shocking uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, and uh, this is a, a dashboard assessment um, just uh, five days ago where I had a look at what our enrollment is at. And uh, so this on the left, as you see, is the local UBC enrollment. On the right is the national enrollment. You just draw your attention to the red box to say uh, until previously, until recently, this was uh, uh, um, largely driven by two funded CIHR uh, uh, registries of uh, ARVC and Long QT and the previously funded Casper registry. This is now folded into anyone who has an inherited risk uh, for uh, sudden death. And it now includes patients including Brugada, CPVT, and unexplained uh, sudden death. So we have 6,300 patients enrolled, and we have biobank samples on about 2,500. So that gives you a little sense of the scope of things. Now, what does that do in terms of data? So all of these people have some baseline information that's collected, putting uh, data into the database. And so that database now not only does include the data points, but it also includes things like uh, the source ECGs uh, and stress tests and procainamide results and so on. And what we've begun to do is look at some other file formats and so on that are more digitized as opposed to analog or report type things and transform those into the potential to really increase the scale of the accessible data. So if you look here in the typical year, this was after 2019, um, ECG stress test holders and drug challenges, particularly procainamide challenges, require expert review. So we're now creating an enterprise where we are increasing the number of individuals who uh, are, uh, are reading tests to try to get data into the data field. And so we're getting almost 3,000 tests a year or almost uh, 250 tests per month that require interpretation and digitization. 
and that doesn't include the backlog because we're going back to patients who have had previous ECGs, etc., and try to upload those. So as hard as we are working, we're kind of like the national debt. We're celebrating the fact that it's growing less than it used to in the sense that we're working away at interpreting this. But what this tells you is we have an immense amount of data being generated that is well suited to automated analysis. And with that comes a transition into automated um, digital data on a large scale. So for instance, uh, your ECGs are typically stored in some kind of small file format, like a PDF format. But in fact, the source data is in what's called an XML format. There's also a hilltop and so on. And if you think about it, the ECG is 12 seconds. If the sampling rate's of 500 hertz, you're talking about 60,000 data points. So there's a lot of data in the ECG, 50,000 metadata points. And so we already have more than 1,000 ECGs in XML format, so that's 50 million data points. Um, a typical Holter monitor has 2.2 million data points in it. DICOM images from ECHO and MRI, we've now begun to upload and store those. This is typical core lab behavior, but the point is the scale of the data is staggering. And we're just beginning to collect these files. A genetic test started off with simple reports or a single gene entry. It went, then went to variant call files, which is all the variants of the relevant uh, genetic uh, cardiac, cardiac genes. And now we're looking at what are called BAM files. And these are files that are about two to three gigabytes and they store the raw genomic sequencing data. Uh, and so far we have 50 of these and the numbers are gonna increase. We've also completed recent whole exome sequencing on uh, more than 200 uh, cardiac arrest patients. So the scale of data that's being generated is rather dramatic. So here's a little illustration of the scale of uh, what we're doing in long QT and how it could be applicable. So if we go back to our two young brothers and one with a striking ECG and one with a not very striking ECG. So we then took this approach uh, and this machine learning strategy to try to diagnose long QT syndrome. So we took a bunch of long QT one and two patients who are genetically confirmed long QT patients from our national registry. And we also used its controls, they're unaffected family members. So these are gene negative family members. So the scope of the control group is not the same scale as what you saw in the Mayo paper. And we compared them and then use this algorithm, which uses different strategies for trying to identify the way to sort out which of the patients with long QT. As you might expect, because this is intended to be a population strategy for long QT, um, the resting ECG is in fact the mean QT, uh, corrected QT of the affected individuals is, ju is just over 460. So this is not a severe phenotype. This is a population kind of phenotype. And so almost half of those patients had inconclusive ECGs. Uh, if I showed you the methodology, it's a six-page Word document. Um, I have an interest in math and physics and calculus and that type of thing, and it's just mind-blowing. So it's not something you can easily get your head around. Uh, but let's look at what the results are. So the results show uh, ROC curves, or area under the curve, of 0.96. 96% if you like accuracy or ability to detect those long QT patients. Now this is preliminary. We're trying to increase the scale of this. This uh, requires the, that XML format of ECG. But the point is that we have uh, a rather dramatic ability to improve our detection of long QT syndrome and potentially apply it, for instance, in your electronic health record system. So what else is new? So this is something that was just out actually earlier this week in circulation, it's a letter. Uh, and here what they're doing is they're, they're trying to identify uh, gene regulators. And if you look uh, on the left here, they've developed an algorithm by which they can try to determine the degree to which um, a second gene, not the culprit variant that causes the long QT or ARBC, for example, but second components or base pairs within the gene are regulating, are either uh, over or typically uh, down-regulating expression of certain genes. And what you see here in this situation is using this algorithm, they were able to detect a 20 to 80 percent suppression in the uh, in the uh, in the relevant gene with these uh, gene pairs. So this may be the kind of thing that, on a large scale, could help to identify 
those things that could suppress the function of the uh, what we used to call a mutation we now call a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant. So this is beyond uh, my level of basic science understanding, but if you look at the gene list, you can see on the top, although the resolution is low, these are sarcomeric genes, these are ion channel genes, and these are genes that are familiar to us because they cause these Mendelian uh, conditions, and some of these SNPs that are uh, culprits that are related to this uh, uh, regulation are ones that have been identified in uh, gene-wide association studies, or GWAS. So the last thing that I want to briefly talk to you about uh, is something that really blew me away when I read this, uh, and it's actually uh, not quite a year ago. And this was the idea that uh, we could detect cardiac arrest using smart devices. So it turns out that when you have a cardiac arrest, you know, wouldn't surprise that you have agonal breathing. And when you have that agonal breathing, it's different than breathing that happens in other circumstances, like resting breathing or sleeping. So what this group did is they took a bunch of uh, audio recordings of agonal breathing and of uh, standard sleeping and other kind of uh, environments and subjected that to a digital analytic uh, uh, strategy to try to identify the difference in the breathing patterns. And uh, they were using a smart speaker. So this was, they were using Alexa. Uh, and what they did, when you look in the bottom left here in, in, in D, is they look at the reds are the agonal breathing and the blue are just sleeping sounds. And then they developed an algorithm that had predictive values to tell the difference in the order of 99.5% uh, negative predictive value, 97% positive predictive value. They then applied a frequency filter. Uh, the frequency filter that they did a couple times then turned the false positive rate down from 0.14%, you can see here, down to zero out of 120,000 samples. So we are talking about Alexa listening for signs of cardiac arrest. So if you think, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Here's the population. This is what they did. Uh, so then they went on to look at real world sleep data because this is a situation where people think uh, that they're concerned about this and rightly so. And again, they, they were able to get the false positive rate down to zero out of 240,000 samples. 40, samples. Uh, and the other thing they did is they yeah, said, hey, not everybody said, has an hey, Alexa. Why don't we just uh, see what their phone is listening to? How many people power down their phone at night? Your phone is still listening. So they used uh, five different brands of uh, commercial smartphones and were able to achieve the same results. If you look at the two different things, both with the smart speaker and the smartphone. Again, detection accuracy is nearly 100%. How amazing is that? So this tells you that digital medicine or AI or signal processing or data management and so on uh, may have, a, may have a, a big impact on us. So imagine then coupling that ability to detect cardiac arrest with notification, where you call the drone to bring the AED, you call all the, the CPR providers that are within 500 meters, and you call 911 if the person doesn't answer the text within 15 seconds or something like that, the alert text. Pretty cool. So in conclusion, big data and AI is more than just large-scale data sets, and its application to cardiovascular medicine is uh, certainly exploding. Uh, our area is well suited to this. In fact, our minds are well suited to this because we are kind of, you know, math people. Um, our, the short-term implications, I think, are modest, but the long-term practice uh, implications are, are going to change how we live and how we practice. And I think we should attempt to connect those people who are interested in this area together uh, so that we can really develop a coalition of interested individuals who want to do research and try to guide uh, this influencing and changing our practice. Thank you. For that. Um... I think now we're open to questions briefly. Excellent. Uh, my camera, this is Jason, um, doesn't work. But um, so thanks so much for that uh, terrific uh, talk, Andrew. It's really interesting, and the potential of of this kind of stuff to predict um, is is really neat. If, if my question in inherited arrhythmias. Um, we're, we've gotten reasonably 
good, I, I feel like, at treating these patients. So events are, are rare. In terms of AI, do you feel that, um, because we, in order to use AI, you need big data. So I definitely see from a screening perspective it being able to uh, help with identification and diagnosis. The idea that you can you know, use this to identify gene carriers who have QTCs in the normal range, I think is really compelling. Do you think we'll be able to use it for risk stratification in the future? Like, you know, which which patients, or, or even in athletic screening, which patients will be at risk of, of, of arrest in the future, given that event numbers are so low? Yeah, we'll put it this way. You know, in, in, if we go back 20 years, um, there's no question that risk stratification seemed to have a lot of promise because there was a lot of risk. Uh, and event rates were high in a lot of things like heart failure and sudden death and so on. And as you saw from some recent publications, the actual event rates with basic therapies and, and you know, risk behavior avoidance, like avoiding QT prolonging drugs, gets so low, you don't have that much to gain. Um, you know, the flip side is I've been looking after long QT patients for a very long time. And twice in the last two years, I've had what appears to be a low risk individual who's died suddenly. Um, a little bit of an audit of what's going on suggests other mitigating factors, but the reality is, you know, the the uh, the um, R squared or the area under the curve of the risk prediction models is still not that great. Uh, look at what we do for you know stroke prevention or stroke prediction and so on, uh, this type of thing. So there's ground to be gained. There's no doubt about that. I think the real question is, are is the answer in the complex analytics of existing data or are there factors we're actually not measuring or digitizing? Because those would be the factors that contribute to risk. Uh, and I think those would be, uh, those would be important. Um, one of the reasons I presented the last section that I did is that, you know, I think there's been a bit of a, a, a false hope in genetics that, you know, once we understand this all, we'll have it all figured out and we can predict and fix everything and gene therapy, everything and so on. And, Quite frankly, with the exception of some of these Mendelian conditions, it's not made a huge difference in common diseases. Uh, and so I think it has to be coupled, and this is one of the hero agendas, is you know, it has to be coupled with public health measures and education and prevention measures. And so when I think about how big data you know, had the ability to take data filtering by listening to you breathe, it's a pretty compelling thing to say, you know, we can't predict all the risk, but imagine just like your house has a smoke alarm, it has a death alarm. And that's your phone. It's unbelievable, I think. You know, you know, all the processes of reliability, applicability, validation, creating response systems, should every house have an AED, all those elements still need to be developed. But big data seems to be enabling the ability to detect those kind of things. Sure. I just wonder in terms of like the long QT registry for big data, like let's say of the thousand people that are in the long QT registry, if, you know, 30 of them have events, I'm just pulling that out, but if it's a small number of events, is that big enough data to use this? Granted, in terms of the big data may actually be in the covariates that you're looking at, you highlighted the number of data points in an ECG, but are we going to have enough outcomes to, to be able to be powered for that kind of aspect? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, one of the reasons we're trying to configure things that in, if you like, a big data format is because the anticipation is the need to collaborate, right? So we, you know, Canada is a small population, and so even if we're good at enrolling our long QT patients, for example, if we can collaborate on a large scale with, you know, European and American groups and so on, we can, we can get those numbers because, you know, you really ideally are looking for at least hundreds, if not thousands of endpoints. And thankfully, that takes a lot of patients to have those endpoints happen. Yeah. I feel like with inherited reading, it, with it, currently, we may need another planet to have big enough numbers just in terms of, you know, even with all of the countries, there's there's only so many of these in terms of patients having outcomes. Um, but it's it's really interesting. I'm sure there's you know there's always a way. Yeah, I I will make an ex I think one of the exceptions to that is um, you know we have a uh, you know arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is a good example of something where there are a lot more events and there are a lot more bad outcomes, and our mitigating therapies are 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 pretty crude. Um, so, you know, things like ICDs and ablations and transplants and VADs and those kind of things um, are, are, are not ideal therapies. I don't think anybody thinks the natural history of even treated ARVC is ideal. So there's, there's ground to cover, but in some things like long QT, I think we're most of the way there. Yeah, yeah, ARVC, totally agree. Cool. How are we doing for time? I think it's transition time. <laughs>
So Jason, yes. I'll just uh, hand it over to you. Unfortunately, I think there are many more questions for Andrew. I think this is a wonderful topic. Obviously, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that are interested on the chat group as well. But unfortunately, we'll have to just move forward. Um, so I'll pass it to Jason, who can pass it on to the next speaker. Andrew, do you want a final comment? Yeah, just the last word. I think my last slide had my email address, but if there's anyone who has questions or comments or wants to get a hold of me, that's the easiest way. I'll do my best to try to be as responsive as I can. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Wael al Um he is a cardiologist at the Ottawa Heart Institute, um, an assistant professor and clinic, uh, clinical investigator, um, of course, also affiliated with the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he received his medical degree from uh, King Saud University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia in 2009. He completed his internal medicine residency at U of T in 2014 and then moved to Ottawa where he completed his cardiology and EP fellowships. He subsequently went uh, and did some extra training with uh, Andrew and Zach um, in inherited arrhythmia syndromes um, in Vancouver. Uh, he currently practices cardiology and EP at, uh, at the Heart Institute uh, in Ottawa. His research in, uh, interests include sudden cardiac death, inherited arrhythmia syndromes, device therapies, and ablation, which sounds like the whole gamut of what uh, we do as, uh, as EPs. So welcome, YL. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today about mitral valve prolapse and sudden cardiac death. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular disease with a prevalence in the general population of about one to 2%. Mitral valve prolapse can be divided into primary when it's isolated to the mitral valve and secondary when it's associated with um, cardiomyopathies or connective tissue disease. Most of the studies that looked at NVP and sudden cardiac death included patients with Barlow's disease, that is the end spectrum of the degenerative changes of NVP. However, some of the studies included patients with connective tissue disease, such as Marfan and Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, and some included patients with fibroblastic deficiency. Multiple studies in the 80s and 90s examined the natural history of MVP and showed that the overall prognosis of MVP patient is quite good. In one study in the New England paper in 1985, the overall survival of MVP patients was not different from a matched control. And in patients with MVP who didn't do well, it was mainly related to mitral regurgitation or LV remodeling. In patients who didn't have significant MR and normal LV, they did actually quite well, which led to the current recommendations of early intervention in patients with severe MR. However, multiple case reports were published about patients with MVP who had sudden cardiac death or unexplained cardiac arrest despite having no significant MR and normal LV. There were also multiple studies that reported high prevalence of NVP in patients who had an otherwise unexplained sudden cardiac death. This is a recent meta-analysis that looked at the prevalence of NVP in patients who had an otherwise normal autopsy. And the pooled estimate is about 12% which is much higher than the prevalence of MVP in the general population, suggesting that there is an association between MVP and sudden cardiac death. The problem though is that you can't really rule out all causes of sudden cardiac death on autopsy. And even in the um, case reports of cardiac arrest with MVP, most of them didn't have complete workup to, to rule out rare causes of cardiac arrest. And because MVP is one to two percent is present in one to two percent in the general population, the fact that it's present in someone who had cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death 
doesn't necessarily mean it was the cause of the cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death. This leads us to this very important paper that was published in 2013 by the Mayo Clinic group. In this paper, they looked at their large cohort of patients without a hospital cardiac arrest. These patients underwent extensive workup to rule out any possible cause for the cardiac arrest. And in 2%, there was no cause identified despite the extensive workup. Then they looked at the prevalence of MVP in these patients, and it was found to be 42%, which strongly suggests that indeed there is an association between MVP and idiopathic VF. We looked at this in the CASPER registry, and the prevalence of MVP in patients with idiopathic VF was 7%. And what was really interesting is that 31% of patients with MVP and unexplained cardiac arrest have an alternative cause for the cardiac arrest that was unmasked by provocative testing and MRI. This is not surprising because MVP is not rare, so it's going to be present in patients who had cardiac arrest for other reasons, but it highlights this challenge and unique feature about MVP when compared to rare inherited arrhythmia syndromes, where we need to distinguish the small subset of MVP patients that are at high risk for arrhythmic outcomes from the, the majority of MVP patients that have benign prognosis. This is also important because when we see patients with MVP, we need to identify patients who are at risk for sudden cardiac death and hopefully prevent it. And there are multiple proposed predictors for sudden cardiac death in MVP patients. I won't discuss these in details, but what I thought I'd do instead is go through some examples of predictors of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest in MVP patients and highlight the challenges and limitations when we try to implement them in clinical practice. The first and probably most important challenge in identifying predictors is the use of surrogate markers of sudden cardiac death instead of sudden cardiac death itself. These are examples of commonly proposed risk factors or predictors of sudden cardiac death in MVP. Mitral annular disjunction, bileaflet prolapse, late gadolinium enhancement, and, and myocardial fibrosis on cardiac MRI. In all these studies, these proposed predictors were shown to be associated with ventricular tachycardia on Holter monitor, which is the most common surrogate marker of sudden cardiac death studied. And while this is understandable because it's difficult to study um, when the outcome is sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest, it results in uncertainty about the significance and the strength of association between these proposed predictors and sudden cardiac death. This is a nice study that shows why we need to be cautious before applying these proposed predictors in clinical practice when the evidence is only based on surrogate markers. This is a study that was published in 2016 by the Mayo Clinic group. The question was, does bileaflet mitral valve prolapse compared to unileaflet mitral valve prolapse predict ventricular arrhythmias? Bileaflet mitral valve prolapse is one of the most commonly used um, predictor of this small subset of patients with MVP. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the, the term malignant bileaflet mitral valve prolapse syndrome is, is used sometimes. And what they, what they did is they looked at their ECHO database and divided patients into bileaflet MVP, unileaflet MVP. And they also had a matched control with no MVP and, and showed that bileaflet when compared to unileaflet is associated with VT. However, the nice thing about this study is that they also looked at VF and cardiac arrest, which is what 
are we really um, what really matters clinically, and showed that bileaflet prolapse actually does is not associated with VF and cardiac arrest. The issue is that most of other studies stop at the stage of showing association with VT. And the conclusion would have been that, yeah, bileaflet prolapse is a risk factor. If you see someone with MVP with bileaflet involvement, they're at high risk and so on, which is not necessarily true. Um, and like any other observational studies, there's probably multiple potential reasons why that is. But especially when we use Holters to detect VT, there is a significant source of bias. That is, if we believe bileaflet prolapse is a risk factor, we're more likely to do Holters more frequently. And if you do so, you're more likely to pick up more VT. So you kind of create that association although it might not be present. The second challenge is that some of the proposed predictors are based on case series without control groups. When certain factors are shown to be prevalent in patients with MVP and sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest, it is not enough to call that feature a predictor because it could be a common feature of MVP in general. Female gender as a predictor or risk factor for cardiac arrest is an example for this because it's mainly based on case series. The largest case series of idiopathic VF and MVP showed that the proportion of females were was 67%. What we don't know, don't however, know however, is the proportion of females in all MVP, because it could be a common feature of MVP in general. And in fact, it is. The Framingham Heart Study is probably the best study that systematically looked at MVP patients in the community and showed that 60% of them were females. So it's not as high as 67, but female gender MVP seems to be more common in females. So is it a risk factor or is it just a common feature of the condition in general? It's hard to know. And most other features, we don't even know the prevalence of, of, of these factors in patients who didn't have cardiac arrest. You know, things like mitral annual disjunction, bileaflet prolapse, we know that they're common in patients who had an otherwise unexplained cardiac arrest but we don't actually know how common they are in patients who didn't have cardiac arrest. The last challenge that I wanted to talk about is the distinction between arrhythmic outcomes related to mitral regurgitation and arrhythmic outcomes related to MVP specifically. We know that MVP leads to severe MR in a, in a proportion of patients, which then leads to LV remodeling, and that is associated with arrhythmic outcomes. This is different from arrhythmic outcomes that are related to MVP specifically and are largely independent of LV remodeling because the way we treat these are different. And I'll go through some examples where there are proposed predictors that do predict arrhythmic outcomes, including sudden cardiac death, but it's hard to distinguish if, if it's through LV remodeling mechanism or MVP specific um, mechanism. And, and as I said, this, distinct, this, this distinction is important because it, the management is different. Flail leaflet, for example, is listed as a predictor of sudden cardiac death in MVP patients. And it's largely based on this study that was published in 1999 and showed that the risk of sudden cardiac death is about 2% per year. However, early intervention on severe MR wasn't a common practice back in the, in the 90s. So arguably, some of the sudden cardiac death risk is related to MR. And in fact, 18% of patients in that study didn't even have MVP. So the risk of sudden cardiac death, at least in, in large, is related to MR and the complications of 
how significant them are. This is a more recent example. This is a paper that was published by the Mayo Clinic group just a few weeks ago and showed that fast non-sustained VT on Holter is an independent predictor of a composite endpoint of total mortality and arrhythmic outcomes, which are ICD implantation and VT ablation. However, when you compare the characteristics of patients included in the recent study to the characteristics of patients included in the initial publication, you see that patients in the recent study were older and, the, and they had more frequently um, severe MR and LVH dysfunction. So arguably the, the high risk of arrhythmic complications could be related to MR and MR related complications such as LV remodeling. So the proposed predictor that is the NVT could be a marker of, you know, worse progression of MR and LV remodeling rather than MVP specific, or we can use it clinically in patients who don't have significant MR and LV remodeling. So in summary, the prognosis of MVP is overall benign. Most complications in MVP are related to significant MR. However, there is a small subset of patients with MVP who are, who are at high risk for sudden cardiac death. And while common features of this small subset of patients um, are reasonably well described, identifying these patients from the large cohort of patients with MVP uh, is challenging. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Great presentation. Well, that was, uh, that was very insightful and informative. Shows us the limitations of what we're working against. Um, I have a couple questions for you um, to get your insight on how you would manage these types of patients. First, um, do you order, uh, how do you risk stratify patients and do you use imaging specifically? Do you ask your echocardiographers to look for some of these more subtle features? and incorporate that into your stratification, or would you use cardiac MRI? Um, and the other question as a backup is, your higher risk patients uh, who have had events, um, how do you manage them? Um, there's been talk of antiarrhythmics, ablation, mitral valve replacement. Um, do you have kind of a standard, standardized algorithm that you work through? Thanks, Zach. Uh, um, you know, I wish I have a, a good answer for the first question, but I don't. Um, I really think that the available um, evidence is not enough to guide what we do. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair for now to use the common features described for this small subset of patients to have a discussion about the risk of sudden cardiac death, knowing that um, many of them and probably most of them are not at high risk, at least not high risk enough to talk about things like prime dimension ICD. Um, the other important point is that I only see selected patients. Um, you know, uh, I, I only see patients who are referred because the cardiologist is worried about sudden cardiac death. So most of the time in these patients, I do have the whole workup, you know, MRI and Holters, um, and even talk about EP study, although again, the evidence is very limited. Um, the, the even harder question is, what do you do about patients who you see for other reasons, you know, vasovagal syncope and you do echo and they have the MVP? Um, you know, but to answer your question, if, if someone is referred to, to, for assessment of sudden cardiac death with, with MVP, I think for now, because we don't know enough, it's fair to collect as much data um, um, as possible. Do you, this is Jason, do you implant primary prevention ICDs for these patients? Um, I do offer it. Um, you know, I think, again, not based on strong evidence, but, um, you know, patients are different. When you have the discussion and you say, we really don't know, some patients would rather um, 
you know, have the potential harm of prime prevention ICD, but not worry too much about the, the risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, again, these are very hard discussions, um, but I do offer ICDs if, if they have all the features. Again, knowing that this is probably, you know, most of these patients are probably not at, uh, at high risk. Yeah, I, I put I some primary prevention ICDs in, in, a, in a few. None of them have had events so far. It's still early, but uh, I, I find it very challenging. Sure, yeah, no, I agree. And what about that second question? Did you answer that? Yeah, so, you know, again, that's one of the, you know, interesting things about MVP is that, you know, usually sudden cardiac death is mainly treated or, um, you know, ICDs are the main therapy we use to prevent sudden cardiac death. Whereas in MVP, there are probably potentially few um, therapies that could work. So, you know, catheter ablation for PVCs, uh, mitral valve repair or replacement. Again, the evidence is really limited, um, um, but, you know, if someone is having PVCs and they're symptomatic, and it, I think it's an easier uh, decision. If someone is having ICD shocks um, and you think they're triggered by PVCs, that's a you know, relatively easy decision. Um, just going after PVCs because they're there, I think it's a harder um, decision. I don't think the evidence is enough to say, you know, blading these PVCs will prevent some kind of that. So again, it's, it's really hard. For the ablation part, I worry that the substrate is diffuse here in terms of the pat muscle. It's not just really a single focus. In the ones that we've done, you know, certainly reduce the PVC burden, but we don't always get rid of it. I think it's potentially different than some of the other, you know, pat muscle PVCs in terms of, you know, substrate mechanism. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Yeah, I've sent a couple of patients to uh, Mayo Clinic, and they're very aggressive with replacement and simultaneous, um, really structural uh, ablation around the mitral valve without focusing the source of ectopy with mapping, but just broad ablation. Um, so, you know, I'm hesitant to send more patients there for consultation because as soon as they get there, you know they're going to have surgery. Even more moderate mitral regurgitation patients, they're operating on. So um, it is difficult to get some kind of uh, standardized approach to these patients um, that we can learn from if we all start doing something similar. Um, but we'll follow up with you about that later. Unfortunately, we're falling a little bit behind, and it's our task to move forward. So thank you so much for that talk. That was outstanding. Um, it was my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Christian Steinberg, uh, completed his cardiology training at IUCPQ um, at the University of Lafayette, followed by a fellowship in EP and inherited arrhythmias. Um, he is now working as a cardiac electrophysiologist and inherited arrhythmia specialist and leading the inherited arrhythmia clinic at his site. His research focuses on inherited arrhythmias, applied cardiogenetics, and complex arrhythmia. I can speak from personal experience and attest to the fact that Christian is really an impeccable clinician, an outstanding scientist. Um, and he'll be talking to us today about Brigada syndrome. I'm really um, excited to hear what he has to say about both um, the electrical and the structural components and the role of catheter ablation. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Chris Steinberg from the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. And uh, this is the title of my presentation, Brugada syndrome, ion channelopathy or cardiomyopathy, the role of catheter ablation. I have no conflicts of interest. As you all know, Brugada syndrome is a rare inherited arrhythmia syndrome and an important cause of unexplained sudden cardiac death. Hallmark is a characteristic ECG phenotype with J point elevation of at least 2 mm and a curved axis segment in at least V1, V2. Prevalence shows significant variability across different ethnic groups. Males are more often affected than females. And uh, at present, uh, the genetics are still incompletely understood 
the only uh, monogenic uh, uh, substrate known is uh, SCN5A, but this can only be detected in 20 to 25% of patients. Our understanding of the pathophysiology has significantly changed over the last 30 years. Initially, it was thought that Bugratis syndrome was a pure sodium channelopathy based on the unmasking and prorhythmic effect of sodium channel blockers and the discovery of SCN5A variants. However, if we integrate more recent evidence, it seems now that Brugada syndrome is rather a microstructural cardiomyopathy that also affects the cardiac sodium channels. Recent data have shown that Brugada syndrome results in microstructural remodeling of the epicardial RVOT and uh, anterior RV myocardium. And this microfibrosis fibrosis may be related to an inflammatory, possibly even autoimmune process. At present, it is still unclear if myocardial inflammation and remodeling are linked to a complex underlying genetic substrate for the majority of cases. So let's talk about myocardial microfibrosis. Uh, the first systematic uh, demonstration comes from a case series published by Nademany and colleagues in 2015 in which they demonstrated on histology analysis from uh, post-mortem or ex vivo epicardial biopsies from unaffected controls and definite Brugada patients the presence of uh, microfibrosis of the epicardial myocardium. This microfibrosis um, would uh, usually um, not be visible on a standard 1.5 or even 3 Tesla MRI, but it can be visualized uh, by creating a standard voltage map using a conventional contact mapping system. Myocardial microfibrosis goes also along with um, remodeling of the intercalated discs as demonstrated by uh, these immunofluorescence uh, images uh, uh, labeling uh, connexin 43. Myocardial microfibrosis is not a static uh, but rather a dynamic process and can progress in some patients over time as demonstrated in this study by the Notar Stefano group in which they took Brugada patients for repeat um, uh, voltage mapping to the lab. With this in mind, the question is what causes myocardial microfibrosis? Uh, at present, the uh, best, most likely explanation seems to be a myocardial inflammatory process um, that has been nicely demonstrated by the group of Maurizio Pieroni, um, who enrolled Brugada patients who underwent endomyocardial voltage mapping and cartel-guided biopsies from the border zones. Uh, histology demonstrated the presence of an interstitial inflammatory infiltrate, uh, mostly um, composed of activated uh, lymphocytes, and this results uh, in interstitial fibrosis. Another Another evidence for an underlying inflammatory process comes from a very recent publication from Bob Hamilton's group. Their study demonstrated that Brugada syndrome is actually associated with the generation of autoantibodies directed against various cardiac proteins, including connexin 43, keratin 24, skeletal and cardiac alpha actin. In the same study, they also uh, performed biopsies on some individuals uh, and the histology and immunofluorescence uh, analysis demonstrated abnormal protein expression aggregates including SCN5A. At this point it is still not clear if the detected autoantibodies represent purely a surrogate biomarker for the disease or if it is truly autoimmunity resulting in the remodeling and arrhythmogenesis. However, it certainly confirms uh, the fact that inflammation is an essential part in the pathophysiology of Brugada syndrome. 
The clinical importance of this microstructural remodeling lies in its role as electroanatomical substrate for ventricular arrhythmia and the type 1 ECG pattern. This has uh, initially been uh, demonstrated by the landmarking publication by Nademani and colleague and subsequently confirmed by other groups. Mapping of the epicardial aspect of the RVOT demonstrates that those area of uh, fibrosis contain multiple abnormal potentials characterized by low amplitude and uh, um, significant fractionation which actually represents an important uh, conduction, uh, focal conduction delay. This focal conduction delay is the, uh, uh, is the substrate for ventricular arrhythmia and creates a transmural dispersion of conduction resulting in a um, current to loss mismatch which is actually responsible for the typical type 1 ECG pattern. This concept was even further extended by this very recent prospective study by, uh, led by Papone and uh, Joseph Brugada, in which they enrolled 135 consecutive symptomatic Brugada patients for epicardial mapping and ablation. They demonstrated that uh, those uh, abnormal epicardial EGMs can actually been clustered into different zones of uh, uh, conduction delay that correspond to the prorhythmic potential. The more focal conduction delay you have, the higher the likelihood that the area is the substrate for a given ventricular arrhythmia and um, ablation of those areas um, reduces arrhythmic burden over follow-up. So elimination of those abnormal epicardial potentials reduces the chance of recurrent ventricular arrhythmia but also results in um, um, sustained suppression of uh, the typical type 1 Brugada pattern uh, as demonstrated uh, uh, in this nice uh, uh, study by Zhang and colleagues. And based on uh, these encouraging results from initial studies, uh, our current guidelines give a class 1 recommendation to catheter ablation for Brugada patients with uh, recurrent ventricular arrhythmia or those who are not candidate or refuse an ICD. Actually, catheter ablation is uh, 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 placed equivalent to quinidine according to current guidelines. So let's talk about a few key concepts of catheter ablation in Brugada syndrome. The first uh, uh, decision is the choice of the ablation site. Uh, only epicardial versus only endocardial versus combined epi or endocardial. Most studies and operators will focus on substrate ablation of uh, um, um, areas with abnormal epicardial potentials, but there are also some recent studies that uh, suggest an additional benefit uh, when mapping an ablation of trigger PVCs or even VF drivers. If ablation is considered, the procedure should be performed with a um, perfusion, with a uh, <coughs> periprocedural uh, infusion of a sodium channel blocker. And ablation endpoints include uh, the non-inducibility of VF and ECG normalization, so that means complete elimination of uh, spontaneous or inducible type 1 Brugada pattern. This is another example uh, of a successful Brugada replation uh, demonstrating a clear uh, type 1 pattern under flaconite pre procedure and uh, complete absence uh, of uh, type 1 Brugada uh, pattern over follow up. A uh, typical phenomenon is the appearance of uh, a STEMI or pericarditis uh, like um, ST uh, segment abnormalities immediately after ablation reflecting the myocardial injury but this should usually resolve within 24 hours according to the literature. When considering ablation the procedure should be performed under infusion of an IV sodium channel blocker to, broadening, to broaden the target ablation zone and to unmask a maximum of abnormal epicardial 
of your T potentials is nicely shown here in this study from um, Pathona and uh, Brugada, where the target zone is much smaller at baseline compared to Ajmalin challenge. Um, the idea is the more you take out, the, more, uh, the better are your short-term and long-term uh, results. In this context, the same group has also shown that the area size of uh, the electroanatomical substrate correlates with the VA uh, burden and the VF inducibility upfront. Um, inducible uh, Brugada patients had a median uh, area of abnormal potentials of about uh, 8 square centimeters, and uh, they even generated the hypothesis that the substrate area size might be. Uh, a good predictor for VF recurrence um, with a, a suggested cutoff value of 4 square centimeters. Some operators went a step further and tried to target uh, trigger PVCs or VF drivers. These data are from a conjoint, conjoint project uh, from the Bordeaux group around Michel Heisegger and the Nedemany group uh, just recently published. They took symptomatic Brugada patients to the lab and performed uh, a co uh, combined endocardial epicardial contact mapping using cardio together with uh, 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 non contact phase mapping using the cardio inside vest. VF was induced in those patients and they tried to localize and isolate the corresponding drivers. For this purpose, the epicardial uh, surface of the entire heart was uh, separated into six zones. Um, from one to six, uh, and what they found is that in Brugada uh, syndrome, the majority, first of all, of VF drivers uh, are located within zone one, one, so the RVUT and anterior RV, followed by uh, the inferior aspect uh, of uh, the RV, and that uh, VF drivers actually co-localize within the areas of abnormal epicardial EGMs. Um, they could demonstrate that VF is as previously demonstrated in animal models or ex vivo models a phase two micro entry that typically turns around those areas of um, abnormal EGMs. In some patients, VF drivers uh, originate from the Purkinje network and can be ablated from endocardial aspects. Those um, initial studies on Brugada ablation are very encouraging. However, it's important to mention that success rates are highly dependent on the ablation strategy and operator experience. Uh, these data are from a meta-analysis that has been published in 2018, pooling all available ablation cases uh, up to this date, uh, which were 233. And it becomes quite clear that uh, a successful strategy for Brugada syndrome requires an epicardial approach. An endocardial substrate ablation approach alone will not be successful. With this in mind, we may ask ourselves, is ablation now a cure for Brugada syndrome? Could it replace the ICD? Could, should ablation become the first line treatment for every symptomatic Brugada patients? Despite all enthusiasm, I would rather suggest a stepwise approach uh, reserving catheter ablation for Brugada patients with recurrent arrhythmia on quinidine or who are not eligible for quinidine because we should not forget that the worldwide experience with catheter ablation is still quite limited. Epicardial uh, ablation is associated with uh, some significant procedural risks. Um, there are still no long-term data uh, most studies uh, limited follow-up to 12 months and uh, we should also not forget that uh, those encouraging studies were all performed uh, enrolling highly selected patients and uh, done by highly experienced centers and operators with a very high annual epicardial ablation volume and last but not least we, sh we should also not forget that quinity actually works very well for Brugada syndrome there is now extensive literature over the 30 years uh, showing the benefit of this molecule for sure. Quinid, uh, there are side effects with quinidine and uh, access problems, particularly in North America. Uh, a lot of the side effects can actually be lowered using low dose um, quinidine, uh, which has been recently demonstrated by uh, Gabriela Mazanti and its group. Um, low dose quinidine was equally effective. Um, at the benefit of way less side effects. 
So let me summarize this talk. Uh, Brugada syndrome is a complex in hybrid inherited arrhythmia syndrome combining elements of a channelopathy and a microstructural cardiomyopathy. Myocardial microfibrosis of the epicardial RVOT represents the electroanatomical substrate for the type 1 uh, ECG phenotype and uh, the ventricular arrhythmia. Epicardial ablation of this substrate is a promising therapeutic option. It seems to be effective when performed by experienced hands. Uh, at present, uh, it should be uh, most likely uh, be reserved for um, patients with recurrent arrhythmia despite quinidine. And epicardial ablation should only be performed by centers with adequate expertise in this complex procedure. Thank you very, mu very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, uh, excellent, um, Christian. Thanks so much for um, uh, that talk. As always, I always learn uh, a lot from your <laughs> talks. I, I really feel like this area is is amazing. The notion that you can ablate and potentially cure Brugada syndrome um, is really kind of, you know, really striking. Not Amani, the, I, I think a really great uh, breakthrough. I think Andrew or Dr. Cron had um, a question. Uh, something that oftentimes comes up is, should we consider um, Brugada syndrome a, a, a form of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Mario Delmar's group talks a lot about the cardiac connexome and how there's overlap the intercalated disc seems to be relevant for both Brugada and for um, uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Do you view them as kind of uh, opposite ends of a spectrum? How do you view their pathophysiology? Yeah, uh, excellent question, Jason. I, I agree with Mario Del Mar's group and uh, uh, Arthur Wilde has uh, proposed a little bit the same concept. I think uh, this, there might be like different uh, pathways uh, or different uh, aspects of a, of, a, of uh, might be like a common underlying spectrum and there are different aspects of this spectrum. I think there's more evidence now that it's actually a cardiomyopathy that also implies uh, the sodium channel. Um, it is still not clear to me um, too with all this uh, exciting new literature how we can link all this together to a complex uh, polygenetic substrate. Um, it's actually getting more complex and confusing than it has been. Um, is it truly autoimmunity? Is it not? Um, I think, however, with those uh, recent data, the cardiomyopathy concept actually is getting more evidence. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that in a few years we will learn that actually ACM and Brugada are just two sides, uh, two different sides of the same metal. Interesting. And, and another question that I have, the, the, the role of epicardial ablation, I desperately wanted to do one of these, but I, I haven't found any pa Brugada patients that have not responded to quinidine. Most of them don't recur have recurrent events after their single events. And, and then when they go on quinidine, those that do, they, they seem to settle. In addition to, to being used for refractory patients, obviously in the setting of primary prevention, we worry about 30 year olds who have persistent spontaneous type one, but doing an epicardial ablation seems somewhat invasive. Do you think in the future, if, if cardiac non-invasive radiotherapy ends up being safe, the disease here is confined to the RVOT. Do you think it's possible in the future we could potentially do non-invasive ablation that targets the RVOT? Granted, we, we don't have a voltage mapped and, and given a sodium channel blocker to extend the region of interest. Um, but that said, a non-invasive approach, it's, do you think it's conceivable that that could work to cure, to cure Brugada in the future? Totally agree with you, Jason. I'm also like uh, being in a blader too, uh, uh, waiting for our first case, but we had the same issues. We have currently five patients under quinidine who did also well, that we actually even discussed as a group that we found it almost unethical to do epicardial ablation uh, in the absence of recurrence. And we had among those two patients who was really initially uh, uh, electrical storm, 
without quinidine and our patients, most of them take doses between 200 and 400 milligrams, really small doses. They are far lower than what has been reported when we look at the initial papers from Biskin or Bell Hassan. And But I think you're right, there are so many interesting upcoming new technologies like SBRT, where we still do not know where it will be placed, in particular for younger patients. But I think, or like electroporation, who knows, right? But I think we should, I, what I learned from these studies so far is, I think if you have the expertise and you have disparate cases recurrent, we should do it if the risks are reasonable. And, and for the broader communities, I think there may be upcoming uh, technologies in the future that may help us to do it more, more safely. The point I just wanted to highlight is there are a bunch of excellent ablators across Canada, but not every center has so many epicardial ablation. And quite frankly, as we all know, these centers like Bordeaux or Nedimani, those guys have an annual volume that nobody has, at least in Canada and even most centers in the US. Yeah, one of my friends in San Diego uh, had dinner with Nedimani a little while ago, and he said that a lot of the bulk of his ablations these days are Brugada. <laughs> I think he's doing it for primary prevention as well. I think we have a question from Dr. Murillo is asking, is there a role for an RCT comparing quinidine versus ablation? You could probably mention Brave, the Brave study, I think, was an RCT that they tried to do. I'm not sure. But do you want to comment on that, Christian? Yeah, I think the idea would be great, but I think there are a couple of issues at this point. At this point, like I think access problem is number one that we all experience here in North America. And the other thing is you 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 need to highly select your centers upfront because you need like if you want to randomize patients, you need a center with this expertise. So if you want to do this in Canada, we would have a problem. And even if you want to do it worldwide, what center do you take? Because if you, you need centers where you have like an operator experience like um, like Nade Manila. Yeah, and I think they tried to do, the, the BRAVE study was registered on clinicaltrials.gov back in 2016 where they were randomizing patients to ablation. I don't know if the comparator group was quinidine though, but I think they had trouble with, although it's, it's, it's estimated completion date July 2021, so I guess we'll see. Excellent. Well, I think Zach and I did a great job at going way over time for our section. So we're very sorry to everyone that we're so late. Um, so we'll hand it over to our uh, next set of people to try and get us uh, back on track. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christian. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, since we're behind time, I'll uh, straight go to the next chairs. Uh, we have two uh, of the leaders of electrophysiology in Canada, Dr. Paul Dorian and Dr. Jeff Healy. Dr. Paul Dorian is a professor of medicine and director of cardiology in the University of Toronto. He is a, an established scientist with research interests in uh, advanced cardiac life support, atrial fibrillation, and clinical pharmacology of antiarrhythmic drugs. And uh, he's a recipient of multiple awards, which I cannot uh, list here because it'll take me 15 minutes. And then we'll go on to Jeff Healy, who is a professor of medicine at McMaster University and the current uh, study music chair in cardiology and the Stuart Conley chair in research, population, research at Population Health Research Institute. Uh, both of these chairs are enough to explain his accomplishments. And uh, Jeff is a, a friend and a colleague. Uh, his areas of interest are clinical trials and cardiac pacemakers and implantable defibrillators with multiple NEGM and uh, Lancet papers. Uh, so without much ado, I'll hand it over to both of them to uh, go on to the next session. Thanks. Thank you very much, Garish. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's, I'll start by introducing Dr. Parkash, and uh, Jeff will then introduce Jennifer Reed. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, we'll get moving pretty quickly. Uh, this session is on prevention of atrial fibrillation topics. Uh, the first speaker is Radhika Parkash, who I think is known to pretty much most of the audience. She's one of the leading lights of uh, Canadian electrophysiology. She's done a lot of outcomes and clinical trials, both in atrial fibrillation, cardiac implantable devices, and in the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation. She's been the chair of the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society Device Committee. Uh, she's led uh, research studies on uh, outcomes after a lead uh, 
advisors and lead recalls. Uh, she's the principal investigator in the atrial substrate modification with aggressive blood pressure uh, um, uh, lowering, and she's a co-investigator in Impact AF, and she has had a long-standing interest in the uh, methods of either detecting, preventing, and uh, managing atrial fibrillation. And with that, I'll pass that on to uh, Radhika. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me uh, here uh, to discuss risk factor modification for treatment of atrial fibrillation. How do I approach the difficult to manage AF patient? We'll start with a case. This is a case of Mr. RF. It's a 40 year old gentleman referred with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation with symptoms of chest pain, dizziness, tunnel vision, and weakness. He was initially treated with brain control medication and discharged home. He's had ongoing episodes of palpitations and symptoms lasting several hours, occurring frequently. He has a history of hypertension for the last five years. He's an ongoing smoker and is prone to binge drinking. On review of systems, it's discovered that he snores at night and does not sleep well. Major findings on physical examination were significantly elevated. Body mass index at 44.4 and weighing 144 kilograms. The remainder of his examination was normal. His echo was unremarkable with a left atrial size of four centimeters. This is his electrocardiogram uh, indicating atrial fibrillation with a reasonably well-controlled rate. And here are some options for therapy that we would all consider as reasonable. Now, I think that uh, looking at these, that the most obvious uh, answer is, of course, um, the longest answer. Uh, as you know, in multiple choice examinations. And in this one, you could argue that rhythm control could also be used. Now, this is our um, algorithm of treatment of atrial fibrillation dating back to 2014. In our most recent uh, iteration of guidelines that are coming out in October, you'll find that the uh, recommendations regarding atrial fibrillation have been expanded dramatically. We have almost 100 uh, recommendations uh, that will uh, make this whole algorithmic approach significantly more complicated, but certainly provide some more clarity and nuance to patients um, that are difficult to manage. And I uh, think that everyone will find them helpful. But while we await those, uh, let's uh, continue on with our discussion of difficult to manage patients. Now, every patient is different. Um, this patient, uh, as you can see, may not want any help of any kind, um, doesn't really look like the type of person that uh, wants to change much of in the way of his habits. Another patient who is willing to take a medication to stop chewing to prevent uh, weight gain. Uh, others that are happy with a new normal of a triple XL size. Uh, and someone who's actually trying to lose weight um, maybe uh, needs some help uh, to do so. Uh, others that are trying to exercise, uh, at least that's a push in the right direction. And then you have others with atrial fibrillation that look very well, are active, uh, and have fewer risk factors, um, but still have an electrical uh, abnormality that, of course, gives rise to atrial fibrillation, and others that are doing so well that health insurance companies are actually paying them for the privilege of coverage. So the point of all of that was to highlight that every patient is different. Uh, with each patient that you might uh, see, you may have a different uh, approach uh, altogether. Uh, I have always said that if I see 100 AF patients, that I might have 20 different uh, options for therapy. A careful history and investigations to determine the cause of symptoms is critical in uh, trying to sort out the approach to a patient with atrial fibrillation. Are there symptoms due to rapid ventricular rates, heart failure, offset pauses? Do they have symptoms despite controlled rates? Do they have a thyroid abnormality? Is there excessive alcohol use? Do they have sleep apnea? These are all uh, things that need to be considered. Uh, we have a full listing of this in the Canadian guidelines. Uh, to discuss all of the possible etiologies uh, and uh, possible triggers for atrial fibrillation to consider. One of the important questions that I think uh, that we may sometimes forget to ask uh, when we see patients is what are the goals for therapy? Prevention of stroke is, of course, at the top of everybody's uh, list and needs to be uh, sorted out immediately from, from the get-go of seeing a patient. But then there are other goals. Do we want to uh, target mortality? Do we want to reduce hospitalizations or emergency department visits? Do we want to improve symptoms? Do we want to improve the ejection fraction? And all of these different goals may 
necessitate different therapies. For example, reduction in emergency departments may be just education for the patient to tell them when to go to the emergency department and when not to go. Uh, so this, uh, again, highlighting that uh, the approach to the patient may vary depending on what we're trying to achieve. The um, modalities of therapy out there may necessitate, again, a multidisciplinary approach, may require education for the patient, which may be delivered virtually through a platform or through written materials, uh, risk factor assessment modification, which of course is what we're talking about today, uh, rate control and rhythm control, uh, which of course is expanding in terms of types of uh, ablation therapies that are out there uh, with the uh, advent of pulsed wave uh, and um, high intensity uh, frequency ultrasound. Uh, there are a number of risk factors that are uh, potentially reversible. Uh, these are Some of these are circled here, coronary disease, hypertension, heart failure, valvular disease, diabetes, thyroid disease, sleep apnea, etc. Uh, obesity is, a, we had listed as less established risk factors when we put this uh, list together uh, as part of the 2018 guidelines, uh, but certainly is an emerging risk factor that we'll discuss a little bit later in this talk. The progression of atrial fibrillation is uh, uh, obvious. Uh, it, this is I'm speaking to a very educated audience on this topic. We're all aware of the um, experiments that were d done on the goats uh, back uh, by Wiffles um, back in the uh, two decades ago. Uh, we understand that atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation and that remodeling occurs as we have more atrial fibrillation. Uh, the timing of uh, treatments of course, uh, interacts with the AF re atrial remodeling. And what we need to do is make sure that the horse is not out of the barn when we treat atrial fibrillation. And again, we'll discuss some of the scenarios where that was it potentially the issue, uh, resulting in a lack of uh, secondary prevention of atrial fibrillation. Uh, Mina Chung has recently put together a um, review uh, position statement on um, uh, atrial fibrillation and risk factor modification. I encourage everyone who's interested in the topic to uh, read it. The yeah. um, um, reference is uh, down on the bottom. But uh, she has put lifestyle and risk factor modification as one of the main pillars of AF management along with anticoagulation, rate control, and rhythm control. So, you know, a decade ago, we probably would not even be discussing this, uh, but uh, now this is at the forefront of how we manage our atrial fibrillation patients. So what effect do risk factors have on patients with atrial fibrillation? Well, uh, Jeff Healy's group uh, looked at um, the, pa the patients that had risk factors, uh, traditional risk factors for atrial fibrillation and compared those to, uh, to who had no traditional risk factors. Interestingly, only 5% of patients in that registry had no traditional risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Again, uh, highlighting uh, the notion that low in atrial fibrillation may not actually exist. The remaining 95% were compared in one to three fashion for the risk of multiple adverse cardiovascular events, heart failure, hospitalization, and half hospitalization. Not surprisingly, those patients who had risk factors had a significantly increased risk of stroke and heart failure hospitalization than those without risk factors. And here is the central illustration uh, from the paper, uh, again, highlighting the um, effect that risk factors have on atrial fibrosis, dilatation, uh, atrial remodeling, and development of that atrial myopathy. So how do we do risk factor modification in AF patients? Well, let's look at some delivery of care models first to discuss uh, how we might deliver this care and then we can talk about what care we actually need to deliver. Well, the delivery of care models that we have um, uh, that have been uh, studied in randomized trials are, of course, uh, the uh, AF clinic. Uh, this is the Netherlands um, clinic uh, that looked at nurse-led physician supervised care compared to usual care and found a reduction in cardiovascular death, hospitalization um, with no difference in stroke, but the numbers were small. Uh, it was also found to be 99% cost effective based on their subsequent analysis. Uh, we did a study in, uh, in um, Nova Scotia that showed similar benefit in um, mostly AF-related emergency department visits, and that was, again, a uh, nurse-run, physician-supervised um, intervention. 
Recently, there have been two new uh, trials looking at models of care. Uh, the RACE4 trial uh, done in the Netherlands was a multi-center trial that tried to replicate their single, single center trial that I uh, mentioned to previously, and uh, that uh, failed to show a benefit. Uh, they felt that the inexperience of some of the centers led to this finding. But this is again uh, an important uh, finding as the uh, uh, issue of experienced uh, nurses is a difficult commodity uh, to come by and a difficult resource to supply to uh, those around the country. So reproducing nurse-led physician supervised care is a challenge and I think that this study highlights with that challenge. Um, that we uh, are struggling to meet, not only from a nursing standpoint, but also from a resource standpoint. The all-in trial was uh, actually done on primary care practices. It was a cluster randomized trial. Uh, there was about 1,200 patients in the trial uh, with atrial fibrillation. Uh, the mean age was significantly elevated, around 78 uh, years of age. And they uh, managed to show um, with a, a nurse meeting the patients quarterly, focusing on both AF and their non-AF related comorbidities, that they had a reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, again, this one's a little bit difficult to, to interpret because there was no effect on cardiovascular mortality. So you wonder uh, what the nurses were actually picking up uh, with uh, higher touch points um, for these patients. Um, again, interesting in, in the finding that uh, more care uh, leads to actual benefits of a reduction in mortality. So let's move on now to the effects of risk factor modification. Uh, as you can see, the delivery of care models is not um, totally uh, sorted out. We still have some more work to do. As you know, we're looking at virtual care models in Canada. Uh, we have a uh, pilot study going in London, uh, Toronto, and Halifax using a virtual care platform. Uh, we did a pilot study in um, Halifax using an education-based platform, and the results of that are being uh, compiled currently. So let's look at the evidence uh, relating uh, uh, risk modification. So as we all are aware, again, you're a very uh, you know, knowledgeable audience, you're well aware of the cohort studies that support risk factor modification out of Australia. The Adelaide group has done a lot of work in this area. The ARREST AF cohort study was looking at those patients who opted for risk factor modification versus those who did not. Uh, again, this was not a randomized trial. This is a cohort study, uh, and we cannot discount uh, the effect of behavior and um, uh, those uh, types of things in, in this type of study. The legacy study was also a cohort study and focused on weight loss and found that those patients who lost the most weight, more than 10% at where they started, were uh, had the highest um, ablation-free and drug-free um, uh, survival. The first randomized trial in this area was also from Australia, uh, looking at the effect of weight reduction in cardiometabolic risk factor management um, and showed a, a significant reduction in AF symptom burden and symptom severity score, but didn't uh, really look at any other uh, hard endpoints. They did look at AF burden and did find a reduction, uh, but uh, that was done on Holter monitoring and uh, was not a primary outcome of the study. Uh, we looked at a unimodal um, intervention in Canada, looking at uh, the effect of aggressive uh, treatment of patients with um, elevated blood pressures at the time of uh, their catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation and could not find uh, any difference. And this is one of the examples uh, of probably where the horse was out of the barn um, in, in that possibly could have led to our negative result. The other possibility is that uh, aggressive blood pressure treatment actually doesn't help patients with atrial fibrillation and that all you need is standard uh, blood pressure treatment, which is actually done quite well in Canada. Um, uh, in uh, other uh, areas of the world, this study could have been positive uh, where standard uh, blood pressure treatment is actually not as, um, as well done as it is in Canada. The RACE-3 uh, trial was a multimodal intervention trial that demonstrated reduction in AF progression at one year. The targeted therapy arm had a uh, sinus rhythm rate of 75% compared to 63% in the conventional therapy arm. The targeted therapy consisted of uh, heart failure therapy, including mineralocorticoid antagonists, uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, statins, and cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, all uh, patients in the trial uh, had rhythm control.
Uh, the other, the other, other only other uni that looked at um, a recurrence of atrial fibrillation was the uh, study looking at uh, alcohol uh, and abstinence versus uh, those who um, drink, uh, continue to drink, and looking at the effect of that on uh, atrial fibrillation. Of course, alcohol has a lot of calories associated with it, so um, it's difficult to say whether this effect was with weight loss as well as with changes in behavior in general that would be positive when you abstain from alcohol. Um, but this was a compelling study uh, to demonstrate uh, the association of uh, heavy alcohol use uh, with atrial fibrillation. So there is some emerging evidence. Um, obesity, as I mentioned, again, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but there was a recent study looking at um, epicardial adipose tissue in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation uh, and without atrial fibrillation, and there was a significant association with action potential prolongation, conduction slowing, changes in connexin, uh, myocyte disruption, and fibrosis, result, all of which are the substrate for aberrant excitability and conduction heterogeneity in patients with atrial fibrillation. So this was the first uh, in-human study to uh, demonstrate changes uh, associated with um, epicardial adipose tissue, thereby uh, making uh, the, the, the case for obesity as a risk, risk factor um, for atrial fibrillation. So, Currently, the unimodal risk factor therapy is unlikely to work. Aggressive risk factor modification may not be efficacious if AF progression is advanced. Cardiovascular out outcomes are positively influenced by a multidisciplinary approach, we think, but I don't think we found the optimal way to deliver this. I don't believe that AF clinics um, are going to be the, the way of the future. We have a number of ongoing studies that will provide additional data on how uh, risk factor modification may provide benefit in various populations of atrial fibrillation patients, including RASTA-AF, which we're doing here in Canada and the Netherlands, and that's a multimodal randomized trial um, looking at risk factor uh, modification in patients who have atrial fibrillation going for ablation. There's a pulmonary vein isolation renal denervation trial, and there's a trial using metformin. Uh, out of uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and of course, we're looking at delivery care models. Uh, CanNet is looking at that, and we hope to have some headway uh, in that area. Um, can't plug it, uh, the rest of AF trial enough. Uh, please get involved. Please put patients into the study when your uh, center is able to recruit, and we'd be happy to help, help you along in that area. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Radhika. I, I'm, I may, uh, sorry, I, I don't know if I was muted or not muted. Um, uh, that was a really fantastic, comprehensive uh, um, overview. I don't see any questions from any of the uh, audience. I think in the interest of time, we I don't want to spend too long on this, but a lot of the lifestyle changes that you're, you've mentioned, which I think are all likely to be very effective, are extremely difficult to obtain. Uh, they're expensive. They, there's lots of recidivism. What's your sense of the most sort of efficient way? Should this be the AFib clinics? Should this be specialists like exercise physiologists, nutritionists, psychologists? How do we go about getting our patients to make these extremely difficult uh, lifestyle changes? I think that's the million dollar question, uh, Paul. I mean, I think that all of those people that you mentioned, uh, can you imagine the cost for trying to do that for all AF patients? So, uh, I mean, you know, I'm hoping that we can make some headway with virtual care, trying to empower patients more uh, on atrial fibrillation, but we'll see. You know, we I think these are things that we have to study. Um, we also need to know uh, what, you, you know, whether doing all this has a, a significant enough effect. I mean, certainly there are some people who've drunk the Kool-Aid on this. Um, you know, I can't get Larry Stearns to get involved in my trial. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and are they right? I mean, you know, do we need to put all this effort and do we need to put all this money in? I think so, but let's make sure that that is the case. And then I think we can figure out what the best delivery of care is. We have to make it resource conscious. Um, you know, uh, all of those things you mentioned, I think probably would save a lot of money, to be honest, for the population at large. But uh, getting people to buy in and getting people to um, to do uh, all of those things, uh, were, you know, even in our trial where we're, we're putting a lot of effort at, at uh, changing those risk factors, um, 
you know, some of the patients are overwhelmed. I mean, there's no question. It's a lot of information that's thrown at them. So, you know, there, there are some struggles on, on both ends, but uh, I, I don't know uh, where we're going to land. Um, I think AF clinics are great uh, when they work, as we've seen, but um, they are tough to, to resource across Canada. Um, I, there's one question from Larry Stearns. Uh, speaking of Larry Stearns, uh, a question is, do you have any formal cutoffs for when you would refuse to do an ablation? I'm assuming he means weight cutoffs. I don't know if yeah. he means alcohol intake cutoffs. Uh, I, I think it means weight. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, uh, we have Martin Gardner at our center who won't put an ICD in anybody who smokes. So we have some fairly you know, strict people uh, in health. Facts, but uh, uh, this good question, uh, Larry. I mean, um, I, I presented the case uh, because you know I think that he is above the weight that I would um, say is reasonable to go ahead. I mean, there's there's higher risk of vascular complications in people who are who are overweight. Uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of issues that you run into. Um, I don't have a number, um, but I think when the BMI is is above you know, 38, I think we're getting into a place where we're um, just beating a dead horse. You know, we need to do something different for those people. And, you know, they're in bariatric surgery. I didn't even go into that, but the idea of bariatric surgery maybe uh, is something that needs to be studied when uh, the BMI is, is that elevated. Um, I will just read that uh, time is getting on. So with apologies to Carlos, Carlos Morello asks, how about something like they did with the Barber study, hypertension study, get the community involved? Uh, maybe I'm going to ask Dr. Parkash to answer that to Dr. Murillo offline because we're pretty late. Let sure. me turn the microphone over to Jeff Healy, who's going to introduce uh, Jennifer Reed. Jeff, I'm not sure we can hear you, Jeff. Or maybe you can introduce then. I think Jeff is. Yeah, Je Jeff is, uh, Jeff is, I can assure everybody that Jeff is not mute. Um, uh, I assuming everybody can hear me. So <laughs> let me introduce uh, Jennifer Reed, who not everybody may know. Uh, Jennifer is a PhD, a kinesiologist. Uh, she's a scientist at, uh, in Ottawa and the director of uh, exercise physiology and cardiovascular health in cardiac prevention and rehab at the Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, she's done a lot of research on exercise and particularly exercise in patients with atrial fibrillation, some important trials both in permanent and non-permanent AFib, and her main research effort and expertise is in exercise and cardiovascular prevention and treatment. Um, she's doing a number of trials with CanNet and with uh, the Canadian Association of Cardiovascular Prevention, primarily on exercise rehab and particularly in uh, atrial fibrillation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer Reed. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for virtually attending my presentation, which will focus on the role of exercise training in the management of atrial fibrillation. I'm Jennifer Reed, a scientist and the director of the Exercise Physiology and Cardiovascular Health Lab in the Division of Cardiac Prevention and Rehabilitation at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. I'm also an assistant professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health in the Faculty of Medicine, an adjunct professor in the School of Human Kinetics in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Given the quickly expanding, quickly expanding literature base, exercise and managing atrial fibrillation, a 15 minute presentation on this topic quickly becomes a tall task. To ensure a presentation that provides depth and some breadth, this presentation will focus on the general population, not athletes, those with AF, not at risk of AF, and exercise training studies and exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation. As you are aware, atrial fibrillation is characterized by an irregular rhythm and rapid heart rate. 
The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with age and is particularly higher in those over the age of 80. The thick line on this figure represents average AF prevalence rates by age group as derived from a pooled analysis of the individual studies weighted by sample size. There are approximately 300,000 Canadians living with AF. Given Canada has an aging population, the number of Canadians living with atrial fibrillation and those around the world is expected to increase substantially. Patients with AF can suffer from disabling and highly variable symptoms, including exercise intolerance, diaphoresis, palpitations, anxiety, dizziness, chest discomfort, acute or chronic heart failure, fatigue, depression, and dyspnea which can lead to dramatically reduced quality of life, substantial morbidity and mortality from heart failure, stroke, and other thromboembolic conditions are also associated with AF. The clinical management of atrial fibrillation is focused on improving quality of life and reducing symptom burden associated with this medical condition. The tools primarily used to achieve these goals include rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation medication. Research has shown that more than 80% of patients report ongoing AF symptoms despite these treatments. The exercise in atrial fibrillation literature has been substantially increasing over the past few years, including several systematic reviews and a Cochrane review, which have examined the impact of exercise training on physical and mental health and safety aspects of exercise training in those with AF. In 2013, in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, Jack Antonio and colleagues published the first systematic review of the health benefits of exercise rehabilitation in those with atrial fibrillation. Later in 2013, my colleagues and I published a systematic review examining the chronic effects of exercise training in those with permanent atrial fibrillation only. In 2014, Rizim and colleagues published the first Cochrane review examining exercise-based cardiac rehab for adults with AF. This was followed in 2018 by a systematic review by myself and colleagues examining the impact of cardiac rehabilitation in patients with atrial fibrillation. This included a focus on mental and physical health outcomes. And most recently, in 2018, SMART and colleagues published a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized and non-randomized trials examining exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation in those with AF. Collectively, these systematic reviews revealed that the health benefits of exercise training in patients with atrial fibrillation include improvements in peak aerobic power, functional capacity as measured by the six-minute walk test, strength, power, activities of daily living, quality of life, cardiac function, as denoted by lower resting and maximal heart rates, and improved left ventricular ejection fraction, and symptom burden. Our research group published a practice article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal entitled, Five Things to Know About Exercise Training in Patients with Paroxysmal, Persistent, or Permanent Atrial Fibrillation. Our fit approach for AF, meaning frequency, intensity, time, and type, incorporates findings from systematic reviews focused on exercise training in the AF population. This approach suggests that patients with atrial fibrillation should exercise at least three days per week at a moderate intensity as measured by heart rates of 90 to 115 beats per minute, or 64 to 76% of peak oxygen consumption, for a simple tool to assess exercise intensity, one could use the talk test. Patients should exercise at intensity that permits simple conversation. Patients should exercise for at least 60 minutes per session using activities involving large muscle groups, such as walking, jogging, rowing, cycling, or swimming. However, it's important to note that patients should build to these targets as not all, especially those who have not been habitually physically active, could engage in exercise sessions at least 60 minutes in duration or at least three days a week. A gradual progression is needed for patients beginning an exercise training program or a simple physical activity plan. Our recommendations are similar to those to the Canadian Association of Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation Exercise Recommendations for Cardiac Rehabilitation Patients.
These guidelines encourage exercise most days of the week at a moderate to vigorous exercise intensity, a total exercise duration of 60 minutes, including a five to 10 minute warm up, 20 to 40 minute conditioning period, and a five to 10 minute cool down, incorporating aerobic and resistance training activities. The last edition of the CACPR guidelines was published in 2019. These guidelines are currently being updated, and as a member of this committee, I suspect there will be a specific section focused to patients with atrial fibrillation. Despite the growing evidence supporting exercise training and managing atrial fibrillation, current national and international guidelines for the management of patients with AF do not include specific recommendations for exercise training. This is consistent for Canada, Europe, and the United States. Given the substantial financial burden of atrial fibrillation on healthcare costs, using existing clinical infrastructure and resources may be a promising solution for managing the physical and mental health of this burgeoning patient population. My colleagues and I examine the impact of cardiac rehabilitation on mental and physical health outcomes in patients with atrial fibrillation using a match case control design. 94 patients with heart disease were included, 47 patients presented with atrial fibrillation, 47 patients did not. A combination of persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation patients were included. These patients with heart disease with and without atrial fibrillation enrolled in a 12-week cardiac rehabilitation program consisting of structured exercise training two days per week, risk factor assessment and management, and access to support services including smoking cessation, vocational counseling, nutritional counseling, and psychosocial support. Quality of life was assessed using the SF36, and mental health was measured using the hospital anxiety and depression scale. We observed statistically and clinically greater improvements in energy, emotional well-being, social functioning, pain, and the physical component summary score in patients without AF than with AF over time. We did not observe any statistically significant differences in cardiovascular health indicators, including body mass index, waist circumference, heart rate, and blood pressure between patients with and without atrial fibrillation. Cardiac rehabilitation programming, which has been repeatedly shown to improve clinical outcomes in patients with diverse cardiovascular diagnoses, does not appear to address the significant clinical issues encountered by patients with AF, as none of the improvements in quality of life reach statistical or clinical significance. Now let's transition from continuous forms of exercise training to high intensity interval training. HIT is a form of exercise in which individuals alternate periods of short duration intense work with less intense recovery periods. HIT is traditionally used to train athletes requiring high levels of fitness and dates back to the times of the ancient Greeks. This form of exercise training has garnered substantial interest and in application in patients with heart disease in the past decade. There are many HIT protocols that patients, clinicians, and researchers may choose from. This particular figure denotes the common Norwegian protocol known as the 4x4. You begin with an 8 to 10 minute warm up at 60 to 70% of peak heart rate. Then individuals engage in four minutes of high intensity exercise at 85 to 95% of peak heart rate. This is followed by three minutes of active recovery at 60 to 70% of peak heart rate. This is repeated for another three blocks and finishes with a three to five minute cool down at 60 to 70% of peak heart rate for a total exercise duration of 40 minutes. There are many other protocols to choose from many of which are much shorter in duration. It all depends on the patient, clinician, or researcher preference when designing interventions. Many original studies and several subsequent systematic reviews have shown the superior effects of high intensity interval training when compared to moderate intensity continuous exercise training, the standard care for cardiac rehabilitation on VO2 peak, peak power, resting and submaximal heart rates, blood pressure, left ventricular filling speed and diastolic relaxation, high-density lipoprotein, triglycerides, fasting glucose concentrations, 
mental health, including quality of life, and motivation to exercise in those with coronary artery disease and heart failure. In 2015, my colleagues and I published the first case study of a 10-week HIT protocol in a patient with permanent atrial fibrillation in the Journal of Applied Physiology, Nutrition, and Metabolism. In response to this 10-week program, we observed substantial improvements in blood pressure, functional capacity as measured by the six-minute walk test, and quality of life as assessed by the atrial fibrillation effect on quality of life questionnaire. Although in N of 1, these improvements were greater than those typically observed with moderate intensity continuous exercise training in patients with AF. In a landmark study by Malmo and colleagues in 2016 in circulation demonstrated that time in AF in non-permanent AF patients following aerobic interval training three times a week for 12 weeks using the modified Norwegian protocol decreased from 8% to 5% when compared to an increase from 10% to 15% in a control group. The control group was asked to simply maintain their typical physical activities throughout the 12-week intervention. By this point in the presentation, I've hopefully been able to convince you of the importance of exercise training and managing patients with atrial fibrillation. The next important question becomes, how physically active are patients with AF? Chang and colleagues in 2012 examined the self-reported physical activity levels of patients with paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent atrial fibrillation as part of the real-life global survey evaluating patients with AF. This study included patients from 26 countries across South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. Nearly 10,000 participants were included. They reported physical inactivity rates of 54 to 65%, meaning that 35 to 45% of AF patients are regularly engaging in physical activity. This is likely or is a best case scenario as it is well established that self-reported physical activity data is often biased by issues of recall and social desirability. Saman and colleagues recently published an evaluation of the physical activity levels of patients with AF using Fitbits. They showed that patients with heart disease and atrial fibrillation took on average 600 fewer steps per day than those without atrial fibrillation upon adjusting for baseline demographics and medical conditions. As important as it is to assess the physical activity levels of AF patients, we also need to evaluate their knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions to understand the factors that may encourage or thwart their engagement in physical activity. Before I leave you today, I wanted to share some exciting preliminary data from an observational cohort study known as Champlain AF. The study was led study by Dr. Led Kimberly, Kimberly Way, Way, who is a former is postdoctoral former fellow at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, Heart Institute and now a faculty now a lecturer at Deakin University, University in Australia. The study included 800 patients with paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent AF. We assessed their physical activity levels using the International Physical Activity Questionnaire and a series of investigator-initiated and validated questions assessing knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions regarding physical activity. Here's a sneak peek at some of the data. When asked whether a healthcare professional had spoken to them about engaging in physical activity to manage their AF, 58% reported no. When asked how important they thought physical activity is for managing their AF, most reported important or very important. When asked if their AF would improve if they were physically active, most reported agree or strongly agree. We also observed that patients with AF engaging in more minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity reported greater quality of life as measured by the atrial fibrillation effect on quality of life questionnaire. If interested in learning and reading more about the Champlain AF study, please keep an eye out for our future publication. Thank you for virtually attending my presentation this evening, and thank you to the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society for the invitation to present on exercise training in patients with atrial fibrillation. I've provided my contact information in the bottom left-hand corner, and I'll now take questions. Thank you.
much, Jennifer. I'm not sure. I think everybody can now hear me. Thank you. Uh, that was a fantastic overview. Um, I don't see any questions, and I, we're running a little bit late, but I'll just uh, leave you with the same kind of questions that uh, Dr. Parkash um, answered, which is the issue of uh, motivation and sort of strategies. Uh, one wonders to what extent that there's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that patients who are more motivated uh, do more activities, uh, have better lifestyle factors, are less likely to get AFib, and whether the observation that uh, many AFib patients are inactive is the cause or the consequence of AFib. Can you hear me, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, great. Very good question. Um, you know, I think it, it comes back to really drilling down to some of the knowledge and attitudes of these patients that are sitting in front of us when inquiring about lifestyle behaviors. I found it particularly surprising that um, we're just finishing up two larger RCTs looking at different modes of exercise training in permanent um, and also persistent patients with AF. And the number of patients who have not engaged in exercise for years, never expressed an interest, never tried out any particular forms, the gains that we're seeing from simply applying 15 to 20 minutes of interval training is really interesting in this group and not saying that it is going to be the you know, one modality that we, we choose to go ahead with. But I do think that there needs to be a bit of creativity in terms of how we approach physical activity for such patients and, and really drilling down into some of their behaviors and thoughts or prior conceptions to really work with these patients. Because having a an approach that requires multi-modes of application, I think is going to be very difficult and expensive for these patients. Thank you. Uh, I, the time is getting on. I'm just going to ask you one question. As a practical matter of advice, uh, how would you approach the typical patient who may be between 60 and 70 years of age, maybe moderately but not terribly active, hasn't done a lot of sports, and you want to get them interested in a high-intensity interval training? Should they do this at a club, at a gym? with a Peloton if they can afford it? Like, how do we get them started? I would go even much simpler than that. So if they're regularly walking or some form of basic exercise, I would probably gradually increase that over a few weeks. And then in order to get them involved in HIT, my, my approach that I usually use is if exercising outdoors, use telephone poles. So try speed walking from one pole to the next and then a slower walk and gradually build up if they're comfortable perhaps with a with a slow jog but getting the idea of using what's available in the community not necessarily having to go to a gym obviously given COVID, but using what they have to try to build up bursts of higher intensity activity into their day is what i would recommend starting off with that's very useful all right well thank you very much um i we really appreciate the speakers from this evening session and let me pass this the microphone back to dr nair Thanks, Girish. Hi, everybody. Uh, those were fascinating talks. Uh, we've run a bit uh, long, but I think the talks were worth it. Uh, thanks to all the chairs and the speakers, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll continue tomorrow morning. The Jeopardy session has uh, started and uh, is going full blast with Calgary in the lead. So I would request all of you to uh, participate and uh, encourage our fellows in training. Uh, thanks and good night.